My name is Forrest, one of the ministers here, and we're just super grateful to have you with us. If you're visiting for the first time, uh, we hope you come back and we hope you keep coming. Uh, we are just so grateful uh, that you've joined us uh, this Sunday morning. You can be opening your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, before we get uh, back into God's Word here as we were studying through uh, the book of Ephesians, we only have two sermons left from the book of Ephesians. So buckle up because it's a grand finale. It's a grand finale. Teens are heading out to a teen class right now in the cafeteria. You don't have to listen to me any longer, teens. You've been released. So follow Garrett there to the cafeteria. Almost forgot on that. Uh, but a few things just to be aware of. We're just going to fly through these announcements real fast. We have midweeks this week uh, out east uh, and uh, up in uh, Scottsdale. Uh, wh whether you're in East Point or Midpoint Ministry, I think you know the times and the locations. It's there on the screen. Uh, this next Sunday, we are not here. We're not able to use the auditorium because of graduation next Sunday. So we're doing house church by family group. So if you're new to us and you don't know what that means, just talk to the person next to you. Go to their service. We're going to have services all throughout the East Valley. Should be a great time to connect. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the next Sunday we'll be back. Uh, there is a mature singles meeting today uh, right after service uh, in this room over here. There's a, a room behind this wall. So anybody who's interested in coming to that mature singles meeting with Aaron Hawkins, please meet there right after church in the room uh, behind that wall right there. A uh, couple more things. Special missions is coming up. Uh, we support the Philippines, a lot of local work as well. This church has been very generous historically, and the needs are still very great. Uh, so please take time to give. Our goal is 10 times our weekly contribution. Uh, uh, this next Sunday, you can give online. We will not be in person. If you want to give in person with a check, we'll be collecting that the first installment on May 29th. But you can give online anytime, phoenixchurchofchrist.org. Uh, and then we'll have another uh, collection, of course, in August. And then lastly, parents, don't forget to register your middle schoolers and high schoolers for teen camp. Uh, that is coming up, and the price goes up. The price goes up uh, in a few weeks if you don't get registered early. So make sure you get signed up uh, for that. Uh, amen. That's all my announcements. Uh, but I have one more announcement. Um, we have been looking for uh, a full-time youth and family couple uh, for quite some time. The weeklies came in. They're kind of doing that and midpoint. And we decided over time we really need to have a couple focus on that need. But we wanted a, a, an older couple to really be able to work with the parents of all the teens and the middle schoolers. And uh, Jesse and Stephanie Thomas, a lot of you know uh, them. They've been part of this church for a long time. They've been serving as missionaries over in Moldova now for almost a year. Uh, and the staff and the elders have really wrestled with this, really prayed about it. And we want to put before the church, hiring Jesse and Stephanie Thomas to do youth and family congregationally uh, once they get back this summer. Uh, and so today is a day, amen, you can applaud, that's fine. <laughs> I'm sure they'll be encouraged by that. There wasn't boos and thumbs downs when we said that, but uh, didn't think there would be. They're very loved by the church here, obviously. They're full of faith right now, full of conviction. They're going to come back from overseas and really impact the church, I believe, in a great way. But we're putting this out there to the church to get your feedback. If you have any concerns, questions, please talk to me. Talk to other staff. Uh, we really believe God can use them in a great way to move our youth and family ministry forward uh, in, in, in the months and years to come. So, so be praying about that, and, uh, and, and we just want to get feedback today. We're going to have another announcement about some other interns possibly next week. It's just exciting. God is just moving. He's working uh, in our ministries and in the church. Back to the book of Ephesians chapter 6 today. We're going to be looking at Ephesians 6 uh, verses 10 through 20. And today is a very important topic. Uh, I, I'm sure you got plans for lunch. I'm sure you're excited about the Suns game. I'm sure you're, you're get, you know, whatever it is, it can be so easy at this point in the, in the service to check out a little bit. But I'm asking you to check in because, you know, we have, we have walked through the book of Ephesians. It's incredible the picture that Paul gives us. He started out in chapter 1. You have every spiritual blessing in Christ. He talks about how believers in chapter 1, 19 to 20, had the same power in them that rose Jesus from the grave. Chapter 2, he says, you were dead as that roadkill on the road. But he said, but, but you've been made alive in Christ. He talks there, too, in chapter 2 about a new humanity, how that barrier to the Jew and the Gentile is no longer there in Christ. In chapter 3, he has this beautiful picture of the church and how the church, you know, together can grasp Christ's love and how the church together can, can reveal the manifold wisdom of God. So it's 1 through 3, it's all about, look what God has done for you. And then in chapter 4, he shifts and he starts to talk about, you know, purity and holiness and unity 
and all these challenges that, that we, although we have these spiritual victories from Christ, that we in, in this earthly reality have to battle through. And last week we looked at, you know, the household codes, you know, the idea of husbands and wives and children, and it even addressed the issue of slavery. Uh, and, and, and as you get into these practicals in the second half of the book of Ephesians, you realize, yeah, it's exciting to be a Christian, but it's a real battle. There's no guarantee. You or I are all a few bad decisions from, from going right back to our old life. And even just this weekend, we're reminded of the, of the spiritual battle, the evil that is in this country. As we had another mass shooting yesterday, one that was racially motivated on top of that, which is just disgusting on top of abhorrent, that someone would, would shoot someone for the color of their skin. It's disgusting. And we condemn. We condemn that bigotry and that hatred. And I feel for my brothers and sisters of color and friends, friends visiting of color that, 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 that someone would want to kill somebody because they're, they're pro-white and anti-everything else. It's, it's disgusting. But it's just a sad reality that we live in. Evil is real. Didn't just show up today to clap, you know, sing a few songs, clap our hands, and, and, and not be engaged in the spiritual battle. The church is meant to change things. The church is meant to turn things around. The church is meant to combat the evil that's in our society. And that's why I'm asking you to lock in today, because this is serious stuff in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20. And it's, and it's funny, and it's sad at the same time, because even when we try to preach the word, we try to be the church, we still fall short. Because even last week, we talked about, you know, spiritual authority, and, and, and we talked about, you know, husbands and wives and kids and, and slaves and masters. And, and we, we, we had some feedback, you know, that we, we weren't, we weren't as, as clarifying or as sensitive on that topic as we should have been from the pulpit. Especially in regards to slavery, because it's a very ugly blight in the history of America. And so if we hurt you by not clarifying that, that we condemn slavery in all its forms, let, let me say that now. You know, if we hurt you that, that, that we, we condemn abuse of, of husbands over wives using the submit word, you know, again, we, we, you know, we're sorry. But even as we're, we're trying to do good, evil is right there. And so I do want to, I do want to clarify, you know, at, at, from a leadership standpoint, we want to be sensitive to these hard topics like we looked at last week in Ephesians 5. And I appreciate the brothers and sisters who spoke. They did a great job. But even as we're trying to get through a really tough text, Satan can just start to divide us. So if we hurt you last week, please come talk to me. Please talk to, you know, your, your, your leaders that you're involved with. We, we want to stay together, amen? Let's read on. Buckle up. This ain't going to be one of those flowery sermons today. Aaron did all that in his communion for us. That was awesome. Thanks, Aaron, sharing your story and how awesome God is and how much he loves us. But let's talk about the spiritual battle. Ephesians 6, read together with me in verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. 4, verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil and the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Verse 14, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition, verse 16, to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In verse 18, and pray in the spirit, Paul says, on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me, he concludes in verse 19, that whenever I speak, words may be given me, so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we know there are evil spiritual forces all around us. This passage speaks of that, how there are rulers and authorities and, and that have evil intent. And yesterday's events in Buffalo, you know, remind us there, there is evil out there and it wants to influence us. And we are 
so humbled by that and sober by that, but help us today to find power in God. Help us today to find power in Jesus. Help us today to find power in the Holy Spirit to push back the evil, to push back the darkness, to bring more and more light into our lives, into our fellowship, and into this nation that we're a part of, God. Uh, help us to take serious the call to engage in the spiritual battle. And as we look at today, God, to, to really even be strong in the Lord. Help us to learn what that means today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to have a two-part sermon series here to close out the book. Uh, this week is going to be uh, just simply the title, Be Strong. Me and Clifford, just, we just don't get along. I don't know. There it is. Be Strong in the Lord is the title of the sermon, the sermon today. And next week in our, in our house churches, we're going to look at the idea of put on the full armor of God. Because if you don't fill that, that armor of God with a strong soul, it ain't going to matter. So today I want to talk about making sure we have soul strength to, to, to fight the spiritual battles that, that, that God uh, is calling us to. Two ideas here from the text as we close out our time today to really, you know, not just, not just show up for the Lord, but be strong in the Lord. Because that's what it says, right? I didn't make that up. It's not my point. That's why I love preaching the Bible. These, these are God's points. That's what it says, right? In Ephesians 6, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. I'm assuming we can do that based on Paul's command to the church to be that. And that's no different, right, for us today. And just two ideas here. The first is know your enemy. To be strong in the Lord, you got to know your enemy. And number two, you got to know your power. You got to know your power. Let's look first here at, at simply knowing your enemy. Knowing your enemy. No, it passed that slide, but you get the point. Yeah, know your enemy. In Ephesians 6, verses 11 through 12, uh, here for the third time, Paul mentions the devil. Right? For the third time, he, he mentions the devil uh, and his forces. Uh, and, and we see this kind of all through uh, Ephesians. You know, this is, the, uh, again, the third time. There it is. The, the, the devil's in the remote. Um, the, well, that can be true, right, late at night sometimes. Hey, Amen. this is a clicker, not a remote. But anyway, uh, Ephesians 6, he mentions the devil's schemes, right? The devil's schemes uh, in verse 11. He mentioned uh, the devil in, in Ephesians 2, verse 2. Um, we looked at that a while back. He calls him the ruler of the air. Again, in Ephesians 4, 17, he says, Do not give the devil a foothold. We're talking about how we have to be careful, right, with our anger. Uh, the devil is, is the Greek word. Uh, the, the Hebrew word is, is Satan, which basically means accuser. Uh, and, 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 you know, the devil or Satan shows up all over the New Testament. His titles are, are up here. He's, he's called the ruler of this world in John 14, 30, the God of this age in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, the prince of the power of the air, as I mentioned in Ephesians 2, verse 2. Uh, he's also called the father of lies by Jesus in John 14, verse 44. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, that, that he masquerades as an angel of the light. And as we spoke about in Ephesians chapter 2, it, it seems the devil uses all that's without, which, which the Bible calls the world, and all that's within us, which the Bible calls our flesh, to try to, to, try to you know, distract us from God, just like he did in the Garden of Eden, to get us away from God to get, and, and to push us towards sin. And, and, and so over and over, the New Testament speaks of this battle. And how we have this enemy who is very powerful and very real, according to the New Testament. And, and, and it's challenging in, in our civilized society today to talk about this. We think, we, we think we've, we've evolved as humans. Oh, we're not, as, we're not as, you know, archaic and we're not as, you know, we're not as, you know, humanistic as we used to be. But yet, I was at Virginia Tech in 2007 when 32 people were gunned down on that campus I was in the UK when at an Ariana Grande concert, some poor teenagers were killed by a guy who, who blew up a bomb in the name of Allah. And we all just saw what happened this weekend in Buffalo. No, this is, a, this is, this is not, this is not going to go away because the devil is real. We got to know our enemy. And, and that's the challenge. C.S. Lewis, who's, who's great to quote on evil, he thought a lot about this. He, you know, he, he spoke a lot of his theology during World War II. And he says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils, referring to the devil and his evil forces. One is to disbelieve in their existence, which sadly, even some of us as Christians kind of start to do real fast. 
The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. And that's the other extreme we want to avoid as well. They themselves are equally pleased, he says, by both heirs and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. So the first biblical reality check here is evil is real. And second, evil has a plan and intent behind it to attack you, to attack me, to attack us, to attack your family, to attack your neighbor, to our society. And every, every, every movie that we love, it has that story in it, doesn't it? Think, think Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, right? Th you, know, th you know, think Thanos, right? And all the, and all the Mar Marvel heroes. Think Sauron, right? And, 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 and the, you know, all, the, all those people, the elves and the dwarves. Yeah, you, you know what I'm saying, right? Sci-fi people are looking at me right now. What are you doing? fantasy huh? and in real life it's not much different think hitler think stalin think pol pot and, and and i could go on and on and the good news here is the text says you can be strong against evil and you can and you must it says as we just read in verses 11 through 12 take your stand against it that's fighting words aren't they and so just three things here, I think, to learn to know our enemy briefly before we look at one more point here. Are you guys with me? This is important stuff. This is important stuff. Uh, you know, three things here. The first thing about our enemy is our enemy is powerful. Our enemy is powerful. In verse 12, as we just read in Ephesians 6, it speaks of the rulers, authorities, powers, and forces in the evil realms. It's, it's like an army of evil, sergeants and lieutenants and commanders and and, and, and the evil dictator, the devil himself, at, at the head of it all. The Greek word there used for powers is used in Greek language of, of, of Greek astrological influences and gods. It's used of Old Testament monarchs such as Nebuchadnezzar and the, and the Septuagint, and even used in Greek uh, history uh, toward Roman emperors. So it's a very powerful being that it describes. And First Peter 5 equates the enemy, uh, our devil, to what? To a lion. Yeah, it's like a, he's like a lion look, looking to devour you, right? And, uh, you know, I never forget, uh, I've shared this before, maybe when I was at Taronga Zoo in Sydney um, with my family, and, and the lioness that day, she was right at, you know how they have those thick glass, you know, barriers, you know, you can kind of get up close to the animals. Well, the lioness was like right at the glass when we walked up there one day. I was like, oh my goodness. So I walk right up there and there's her big head. And we're like, we're like, we're like having a conversation, me and her, you know, and fortunately she wasn't licking her lips or anything, or I don't think I would have stayed, but, but just to be that close to something that powerful, it just, it still sends shivers down my spine when I think about her, her head just there staring at me, just so massive. And I thought, this is what it looks like right before a lion eats you, you know? And, uh, but the nice thing was I had that thick glass barrier between me and the lioness that day. When it comes to evil, we don't have that. And your enemy, the devil, he's very powerful. Young people, don't be naive. I love it when kids grow up in the church and go, oh, you know, maybe I need to go out and sow my wild oats and experience the world and send it up a bit so I can really appreciate God. That's the most unbiblical, satanic thing you could say. There's nothing that, the, the scriptures teach the opposite of that. They say, stay away, resist, run, flee from, the, from your enemy because he is powerful. Older people, we're still susceptible that stuff you watched, have you been open about that? That coworker you're flirting with, are you, are you getting open about that? that? That dysfunction, that toxicity in your family, are you getting open about that? Our enemy is powerful. Ephesians 5, 3, we read when Aaron and Garrett preached, among you there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Stay away, our enemy is powerful. Secondly, our enemy is wicked. It says in 612, the powers of this dark world. The other phrase is the spiritual forces of evil. You know, I love what John Stott, one of the commentaries I've been using for this uh, study, uh, I love what he said about this. He said, 
referring to these evil forces, they are spiritual agents from the very headquarters of evil. So then darkness and wickedness characterized their actions, and the appearance of Christ on earth was a signal for an unprecedented outburst of activity on the part of the realm of darkness controlled by these world rulers. That's why the demons are just everywhere when Christ shows up, because they're getting scared, right? He says, if we hope to overcome them, we shall need to bear in mind that they have no moral principles, no code of honor, no higher feelings. They recognize no Geneva Convention to restrict or partially civilize the weapons of their warfare. They are utterly unscrupulous and ruthless in the pursuit of their malicious designs. Does that scare you? It should. There, there's, there's nothing, nothing good, nothing wholesome, nothing helpful in Satan in any way, shape, or form. And there's nothing good, nothing helpful, nothing wholesome in the evil that he tempts us with every single day. Our enemy, he, he only offers sin and destruction. Our enemy only offers us anti-God and anti-human and all that he tempts us with. So again, we, we, we got to see through that. The beauty of the scriptures is they expose Satan for who he is. And we can see through it. We can see through that wickedness and not be fooled. Ephesians 5.11, we read again, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. Our enemy is powerful, wicked, and lastly, our enemy is deceitful. Back to the text here in Ephesians 6, verse 11. He talks about, you know, the devil's schemes. There's an old, you know, comedian joke, you know, the devil made me do it. It's biblically not true. He can't make you do anything. He can tempt you. He can fool you into thinking you should choose sin over righteousness, but he, but he can't make you sin. He, ha, he does not have that power over us. Praise God for that. And praise God through Christ, we have great power to defeat him. And we'll talk about it here on the second point. But we got to be sober here. One of his greatest tools is deception. The devil is so good. He's so good that he can even make good into evil. He can even make good into evil. And, I, and again, to quote C.S. Lewis, he, the devil, always sends errors into the world in pairs, pairs of opposites. He relies on your extra dislike of one to draw you gradually into the opposite one. And he goes on. I'll give you an example of this. You, you, you can be so pro-church. I'm pro-PCC. I love the Phoenix Church of Christ. You can be so about the church that you start to be a legalist and you start to be a spiritual police officer and all of a sudden you become anti-church. And people don't want to come to church because they're going to have to see you. And get hounded and get and get checked and get and get prodded and you know what I'm saying? We've all done this and we've all experienced it. You can be so pro purity. I'm all for purity. Absolutely. The Bible teaches it. Ephesians five, not even a hint of sexual morality, right? But you can be so pro purity, you be, you can become a sexual prude inside of marriage. Or you can be a single and, and be needlessly shamed all the time because of, 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 an, of a purity culture. It's the other extreme the other way. You can be so anti-world, all the world this and the world that, that you can become a hateful religious bigot. And there are plenty of those in this country, are there not? Hopefully it's not one of us. If so, repent. You can be so anti-politics or so anti-one political party that you become hateful. You, you make it out like that, that oh yeah, those, those Democrats, that's the enemy. Oh, those Republicans, that's the enemy. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but you can start to think that way. That's why, you know, that's why Peter says in Ephesians 5, 15 to 17, because we can be fooled. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish. Sometimes I scroll through Facebook. I'm not sure we're not, but understand what the Lord's will is. You got to know your enemy. You got to know your enemy if you want to win this spiritual battle. You know, he, he is powerful. He is wicked and he is deceitful. So today I hope we'll know our enemy a little better. So as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, 11, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. You know, this battle, you know, it, it, it's really in between our ears. It, it's a mental battle in many ways, to really, to really know your enemy and defeat him. Because the scriptures, they, they, give, us, they give us all the insight already. We already know how Satan's going to operate. We already know how he's going to work. 
We already know how the devil's going to come after us and what tactics and, and strategies he's going to use. There's nothing new under the sun. And so how are you doing with that? You know, some of us, you know, we're just, not, we're just too naive. We think we can handle stuff we can't handle. I think you can scroll through stuff on Instagram and think you can handle that. And you struggle with lust. And you, you think you can, you can be bitter in your marriage and, and somehow have a good marriage. Or, or, or you, can, you, can, you can cheat at work and somehow you're going to get away with that. You know, and, and Satan, we, we can't be naive about evil. The other side of this is we can't be discouraged either. Maybe today you've, had a, you, you've been sinning. You walk in here and you're like, man, I've been blowing it. And now you're feeling real bad. I didn't come here to make you feel bad. I came here to wake you up through God's word. You, you can outwit Satan. That's what we just read, right? 2 Corinthians 2.11, in order that Satan might not outwit us, for we're not unaware of his schemes. You can overcome him, but you got, you got to be smarter. The battle's often between our ears. And I know for me, with some of the greatest sins in my Christian history, pornography and anger. Those are two of the greatest sins in my Christian history to my shame. But man, you know, the victories have come over the years. And, and, and even today, I could say the victories are there because I'm not so naive now. I know my limitations. I know I got to stay away from certain things. But I'm also, when I get knocked down, I learn through Christ and his grace to get back up. That through him, I can find victory. Through him, I can, I can defeat this sin once and for all. What about you this week? Take your two biggest current conflicts with evil. Take the one sin that you know internally you struggle with the most. And then take the one person, I'm going to say person, that you struggle with the most. Because a lot of those external struggles are often with other people and they're evil or, and are evil together and, and that little dance, right? So take the one sin you struggle with the most internally and the one person you struggle with the most externally. And I want you to take a step back this week and think, how is or might the devil be fooling me? And what can I learn here from this passage to outwit him this week? I wonder how that repentance will go this week if you do just that. I wonder how that relationship might change instead of making the brother or sister like they're the issue when really the issue is evil. You got to know your enemy. And lastly here, you got to know your power. <laughs> this is painful. All right, know you. Amen. You know, as I said there in Ephesians 6.10, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. There in uh, chapter 6, verse 10, it refers to God's strength, God's might, and God's power. And I have those, those, those uh, English words, you know, they're highlighted. The same three Greek words, strength, might, and power, this is really encouraging, showed up back in chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, as Paul is referring to his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. So God says, you got to be strong. You got to tap into, you know, and how you do that is you tap into his might and his power and his strength. It's not about our strength. It's all about being strong in him. And back in chapter 1, he said, he said, that same power that rose Jesus' dead, lifeless body from the grave, that same power can reside in you as a believer. Do we have any idea as Christians how powerful we can be? And I'll say that in a, in a proud way. That's, a, that's an incredible thing to think that we have power, the same power that rose Jesus from the grave. We had that in us to defeat sin. We had that in us through Christ to, to defeat, you know, Satan and all his temptations and all of his little tactics. Christians, you are powerful, but it's not your power. It's God's. God has to get all the credit because only through God can we truly be spiritually powerful. Amen. And yeah, we get to reap all the benefits, but let's make sure God gets the credit in the end. And if you've been having some spiritual victories, I hope you're giving God the praise he deserves. You're sharing that testimony about how you used to be this and now you're that. Make sure you're giving God the praise and the credit that he deserves. This power we have, it's, it, it, it's, 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 it's resurrection power. You know, I love this quote. If we can go to the next slide because I'm giving up on the clicker. Thank you. Some things you just have to accept in life and surrender to. Thank you, Emily. Emily does a great job with all the slides. Have a round of applause for Emily Reeve. She works hard on the slides. 
every Sunday. Puts up with people like me who can't use a clicker very well. But I just I just think we got to be sober. That's obviously the first point. But the second point is we we, we got to start to take our stand. We got to start to, to to find more victories in Christ. And Paul tells us how we do it here. And, and I love this quote by Marianne Williamson. She says, "Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us." I think a lot of times as Christians we sell ourselves short. We don't really tap into God's power. We don't really tap into God's might and God's strength. And, and then we wonder why we're frustrated in our faith. We wonder why we show up here on a Sunday and we just run through the motions because we're not even tapping in to the power that God is offering us. What if we really did that as the Phoenix Church? What, what would our worship be like? I mean, I appreciate Dave Mosquito. He fires up my soul. I appreciate Kevin Harris. Those guys, they, they, they fire me up toward God, but, but I shouldn't even need that if I was really tapping into this power that Paul is talking about that right here. You know, the gospel, a lot of times, you know, we make it into a, you know, a gospel of sin management. Just don't do this and don't do this and go to church and stay away from evil. And, and yeah, that's true. But the gospel is so much more about empowering humans to be their very best. That's really what Jesus came. He, he came to offer us life, right, and life to the full. He didn't say, I came to offer you a life where you no longer have to sin and go to church every Sunday. That's not what he's offering us. It's so much more than that. And this is where religion often goes wrong, trying to, to stay away and, and hang on. That's not Jesus' primary message. His message is that through him, you and I can overcome evil and live out powerful lives of good. And, and this, this world ain't getting any better. It ain't getting any prettier. It only seems to be getting uglier. And the world needs, the world needs to find that, that message that you can overcome the evil in your life. The world needs to find that message of hope in the face of such great, great evil and atrocities. And as Christians, we have that hope in the gospel. So if you're a Christian today, my question for you is, where are you settling for a faith that's just about not sinning? When you should be striving for a faith that could keep changing you and the world where, where are you religiously settling where do you need to step up and take your stand against evil and take your stand against the devil so that's my charge for the christians today is is, is we got to tap into this power we got to know this power we got to experience more and more of this power i mean hey amen it's so awesome congratulations haley i, I know tanner at she was baptized last week if you want to hear about that power go talk to them they can tell you all about it this church is full of people who have experienced that power, but but Christian, brother, sister, is God done? I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm glad you sold your, your explicit rap music back in 1998, but, but God has so much more in store for you. Preaching to the choir there. I'm preaching to the choir, but he, he, he wants to use his power, his might to change you and I from the inside out more and more and more. That's the crescendo of this book. That's the crescendo. You know, Paul's saying, God has so much in store for you, but you got to fight. You got to dig in. You got to tap into his power. So, brothers, sisters, where have you been compromising on that power? And how can you tap back into that this week? What will help you tap into that power? And if you're not a Christian today, this is bad news. You're powerless against the devil and against sin. But the good news is God sent his son to set you free. God sent his son to give, you, to give you life, to help you overcome the evil in your life and in our society. And that's the last scripture here I'll quote before we wrap up. It's, it's John 8, verse 36. Jesus said this of himself. If the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Are you tired of yours and the world's gimmicks and half-truths to winning in this life? Please study, study God's word with us because as you get in God's word, you'll find the power to overcome the stuff that's in your life that's plaguing you. If you get in God's word, you'll find light and truth and goodness and hope. But please sit down with us and open God's word to see how God's word can bring the power of God into your life. Church friends, let's learn before we put on the full armor of God, which we're going to look at next week. Let's learn how we can be strong in the Lord first. If there's not a strong soul filling that spiritual armor, it won't matter whether we put it on or not. Our victory in the spiritual war first starts with our willingness to cooperate with the divine. 
Let's seek strength in the Lord this week. Know your enemy, know your power, and the East Valley of the PCC said, Amen. Thank you.